Hey there, Nish here, and today I have some studies for you on how resistant starch affects your body composition. So what percent of your body is fat, and what percent of your body is made up of muscle. And if you've been around here for a long time, then you may remember my old resistant starch video, where researchers found that eating resistant starch before a meal made you eat less in that meal, and it made you eat less over the 24 hour period after that. If you're interested in that, I will put it up here and in the description below. But instead of talking about how much you eat, in today's video I will be talking about how it affects how much your body is fat versus muscle. So what is resistant starch, you may be asking? Well, it's a special kind of starch that passes through your digestive system undigested. So you're not actually able to process it and turn it into calories. Sorry, my camera battery died really quickly. So in essence, it goes through just kind of scrubbing things out in there and is really good for your gut bacteria and has a lot of other good effects on things like hunger hormones and blood sugar and things like that. So there's a lot of buzz out there in both the scientific literature and the fitness and health media about the benefits of resistant starch. And resistant starch naturally occurs in a lot of plant-based foods you eat, and I will go over sources of resistant starch at the end of the video for those who are curious. And so the question for today's video is can it help you to have a better body composition? So increase your muscle mass and decrease your fat mass. Because in general, when we work out and lose weight, the whole goal is to look more toned and lean, so to have less fat and more muscle. Most of the studies so far that have looked at resistant starch have been in rodents, because it's usually how it goes in science with these kinds of things. You start on rodents, and then you replicate the results in humans. And importantly, so far in the resistant starch literature, when things have been looked at in both rodents and humans, it's pretty much always been the same that I've seen. If resistant starch has an effect in rodents, it almost always has the same effect in humans. And so I'm going to be talking to you both about rodent studies and human studies in this video. And first, at least nine rodent studies have found that adding resistant starch to their diet actually decreases their body fat percentage by anywhere between 8 and 45 percent, depending on the study. So that is a lot of body fat percentage. So it seems like just adding resistant starch to your diet may actually help you decrease your body fat percentage. And importantly, it decreases visceral fat in addition to subcutaneous fat. And as you may know, visceral fat is the one that surrounds your organs and is generally really bad for you in terms of a lot of these types of outcomes like obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So the fact that resistant starch seems to reduce the amount of visceral fat you have could be a really amazing thing for health. And the third very consistent finding with resistant starch in rodents is that it reduces the amount of fat that actually accumulates in fat cells or adipocytes. So it actually decreases the amount of fat that's going into your cells, and that's probably why body fat percentage is going down with resistant starch. But what about in humans? Even though rodent studies do tend to transfer really well to people, it's definitely better to look at it directly in people. And there aren't many studies that do that yet, but those that have are finding similar effects to the rodent studies. So for example, a few studies found that adding resistant starch just to a single meal actually increased fat oxidation, so it increased the amount of fat that people were burning after that meal. And interestingly, adding resistant starch to a meal actually decreased the amount of carbohydrates that people burned. And this is a very good thing if we're shifting from burning carbs to burning fat for the, given the same meal, because as you may remember from a few of my past videos on our ability to turn carbs into fat, we are really, really bad at turning carbs into body fat. It's a process called de novo lipogenesis, and it is really energetically expensive. So in general, if you just have a bunch of carbs floating around in your body and not a bunch of extra fat, you're in good shape because you're probably not going to store many of those carbs at all. And if you're interested in differences between fat and carb burning and what happens to extra carbs that you overeat in terms of whether or not they cause you to gain weight, check out my other videos on that. I'll put them in the description below. I actually have more than that, but <laughs> those are the main ones, I think. And the researchers think that the reason that resistant starch decreases the amount that you burn carbs is because it actually makes it harder for you to metabolize calories in your digestive tract. So when resistant starch is in there mixing up with carbs and fat, it actually makes you absorb less of them. So you start burning less carbs because you have less carbs in your system, like in your bloodstream is the prevailing theory. And some more recent studies that have come out have shown not only that eating resistant starch does seem to decrease body fat percentage in people, but it actually increases your lean body mass, so actually increases your muscle mass. 
And one possible reason that people think this is happening is that it actually increases protein accumulation. So it sort of helps you hold on to your protein that you do take in. So given these benefits of resistant starch, you are probably asking, how can I get more of it into my diet? Well, luckily you don't have to go out there and buy expensive supplements or change your diet a lot, hopefully. It's actually in a lot of things that you already have around the house, probably, if you're like me at least. For example, potatoes. And I should note there are four different types of resistant starch, and I'm not going to get into that in this video because there aren't enough studies yet to really say which ones are better. But in general, resistant starch occurs in things like whole grains, and there's a ton of it in beans, and underripe bananas, so bananas that are more on the green side and not as spotty, and raw potatoes, which I don't really know how those would taste, but if you like raw potatoes already for some reason, you are in luck, um, as well as raw oats. Overnight oats that are made by soaking oats instead of cooking them have a lot more resistant starch than normal cooked oats. And another class of resistant starch is found in cooked and cooled potatoes. So if you've ever noticed that your potatoes tend to taste pretty different the next day after you put them in the fridge and reheated them, it's because a lot of their starch has gelatinized and turned into resistant starch. And this is still present even after you reheat your potatoes, so you don't have to eat them cold. And the same thing happens with rice, where if you cook rice and then let it cool and then eat it, then it has a lot more resistant starch. You've like created resistant starch. And even in addition to these body composition benefits that resistant starch might have, it's also great for your digestive system in general because it's got a lot of prebiotics. I don't recommend adding a ton all at once to your diet because adding a ton of fiber all at once to your diet is a great way to give yourself a lot of gas. But I would incorporate it gradually if you're interested in eating more resistant starch. So yeah, changing your body composition could be as simple as making extra rice and having leftovers for days instead of making fresh rice every day. So I think that's a, a fun hack that's easy for all of us to do. Please let me know if you have any other questions about resistant starch or just questions for videos in general. I am test driving doing shorter science videos like this where I just go over either a topic more briefly or just a single study like I used to way back in the day. I've noticed that the further along I've gotten in my PhD program and being a scientist, the more detail-oriented I've become and the more I want to talk about a bunch of studies on a topic instead of just one, but I know that not everyone has time to sit through a 15-minute video with five studies in it, so let me know what you think in the comments below if you prefer the longer form videos that are like 15 to 20 minutes, or the medium videos that are like 10 minutes, or the shorter five-minute mini videos, or a mix, just let me know. Please like, share, and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. It helps encourage me to keep making these videos because I know that someone out there is watching them and liking them. Head on over to my Patreon if you are interested in donating to help out or if you're interested in coaching. I just got that going, so I'll put all those links below. Thanks for watching and hope you have a good one.